Why, good evening. You know, when I see it raining outside and I see you here, I know God's going to give you a special blessing because God blesses us when we make efforts to come out to serve him and to open our hearts to the word of God when the weather is not so good. Uh, after 55 years of preaching around the world, I've preached in snowstorms, rainstorms, uh, thunderstorms, uh, hurricanes, but yet every night God does something special. So thank you so much for coming. If you have been here four nights, you should have picked up your little book, Hope Beyond Tomorrow, in the English. So how many of you have received Hope Beyond Tomorrow? Can I see your hands? Wow, that's quite a, uh, an excellent group. And then um, if you speak the Spanish language, we have a special book for you called Trusting God on Life's Journey. Be sure to pick that up as well. Let me tell you what's happening this weekend. We have meetings Friday night, Saturday morning at 10 o'clock, Saturday morning at 11.15, and Saturday night at 7. Have you ever wondered if there's one God, one Bible, why are there so many different interpretations of it? Why are there so many different denominations? We're going to be addressing that this coming weekend. On Friday night, we'll be talking about Revelation, the 12th chapter particularly, and God's end time people identified. Then on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock, we're talking about Revelation's most startling message for today. A message that is as important for our day as Noah's message was for his day and John the Baptist's message was. A startling message in the book of Revelation. We're going to take a look at that. And then we'll talk about the four horsemen of the apocalypse, why so many denominations on Saturday morning at 11. Saturday night, the great grand climax of our series, where we talk about the world of tomorrow. What is heaven going to be like? You don't want to miss one of these meetings, and we really encourage you to bring your friends and to come out to be with us. In addition to that, um, you know that there are children's meetings, and I want to remind you that there are children's meetings on each evening and Saturday morning we will have children's meetings as well. So there will be children's meetings for your children during the entire process and during the entire program on Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon. Just now, Pastor Eric Frecking is going to come. Pastor Frecking is the pastor of one of our sponsoring churches in Irvington, and he's going to offer prayer for us. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Thank you. Our Father in heaven, over the past four nights, we want to thank you for blessing us with your Holy Spirit. My heart has been stirred and revived as I've come night by night. And tonight, Father, as we cover this very important topic, we want to ask once again for your Holy Spirit to be with each and every one of us. Give us open ears and receptive hearts. And I pray that you'll be with all the presenters and all the musicians. May you fill them with your Holy Spirit to bless your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Let all God's children say, Amen. Thank you, Pastor Eric. Tonight we have a special guest artist to sing our first song. Um, Angela Brown first launched her career at the Met, at the Metropolitan Opera in New York City. That exploded her career until it became an international career, traveling around the world singing and featured in the front page of the New York Times, featured as well in Oprah, featured in Ebony, and, uh, but most of all, it's not those accomplishments that uh, Angela is most uh, gratified with. It's her commitment to Jesus. And so not only is she an accomplished musician who has traveled the world and uh, been on the front page of newspapers and magazines and TV shows, but the most important thing with Angela is her deep commitment to Christ. And she's going to sing about her love for Jesus just now.
Thank you, Angela. Oh, divine redeemer. You know, God gives different people different gifts. And to see those gifts used for Christ and his kingdom is really refreshing. Have you been 
enjoying the health presentations. I know you have, and I know you're drinking more water. You are no doubt um, getting more exercise. We want you to be healthy. Friday night, for everyone that's here, we're going to give a book out to every, called Living Long and Living a Long and Beautiful Life. Let me tell you a little bit about this book. I did not write the book, but I had the joy of editing it. What we did is looked for specialists around the world. We looked for specialists in heart disease, specialists in cancer, specialists in the subject of depression and positive lifestyle, specialists in the area of exercise, interpersonal relationships, and we've got some of those people to agree to write a chapter in the book, and we produce this book based on about 16 different authors that are, or many of them, world-renowned. If you're here on Friday night, we're going to give you a copy of this book free. We want you to take it home. It kind of summarizes everything we've said in the health lectures and provides you with the scientific information behind them. So be sure to be here Friday night. It's the only night we're going to give this book out. It's yours free. And uh, because we want you to live a healthy, happy, longer life. Now tonight, you've got a special treat. Miss Nancy's been speaking some nights. My wife, Tini, has been speaking other nights. Nancy, of course, is Elder Wilson, uh, Pastor Wilson's uh, uh, wife. And uh, tonight, Nancy and Tini are going to make a presentation together. So enjoy that. They're not coming out jumping rope tonight, though, OK? All right, ladies. Welcome, everyone, to tonight's presentation, health presentation. Welcome. Yes, good evening and welcome again to Secrets to Wellness, where learning principles of how we can live longer, healthier, and happier. So Nancy, what's our subject tonight? Our subject tonight is nutrition. Good nutrition is essential for good health. And among those top nutrients that we need to function are coming from fruits, vegetables, grains, and nuts. You know, the Eden diet was a plant-based vegetarian diet. It was only after the flood that God gave human beings permission to eat meat. After the flood, almost immediately, the lifespan of human beings was shortened. Let's look at this graph. On the left, you see Adam, and you can read this in, the, uh, in Genesis. The Adam was lived for six, 930 years. Methuselah for 969 years. Noah lived 950 years. But several, uh, not long, too many generations after the flood, after they started eating flesh foods, Nahor only lived 148 years. So, Teeny, can you give us some principles of good nutrition? Yes, let's look at some principles of good nutrition. Well, there are three, and that is to choose the right kind of foods. What are the right kind of foods? We're going to share that with you. And then choose the right time to eat. And oh, science is finding that there is a right time. And then choose the right amount. How do you know what the right amount is? Well, we're going to start with principle number one. For good nutrition, choose the right kind of food. What are the foods that you're going to put in that wagon at the grocery store and then place on your table? Well, as Nancy mentioned, a plant-based diet was a diet chosen for mankind by the Creator. And you know what, my friends? We really can't improve on the Creator's plan given in the beginning, can we? That is the best. And science is finding that out because medical researchers have discovered that some foods are protective foods against the killer diseases of the 21st century. What are those foods? Those foods are plant-based foods, such as fruits and nuts and grains and vegetables. And you know what science has discovered? That population groups who eat a wide variety of these protective foods actually have a reduced rate of cancer and heart disease. And over 200 studies in the last 25 years 
have shown that eating a plant-based diet, you can actually reduce even cancer by 60%. So documented scientific evidence actually confirms the validity of a plant-based diet. But Nancy, can we get adequate nutrients from a plant-based diet? Of course we can, because God placed natural ingredients in a plant-based diet. A plant-based vegetarian diet contains adequate carbohydrates, and in spite of what you may hear, carbohydrates are necessary. We need them to produce energy. Protein, you get a complete protein with a whole legume, a whole grain together, and vitamins and minerals. So there are many advantages. All right, well, what are some of the advantages of a plant-based total diet? Total well, plant-based vegetarian <laughs> diet. Actually, a total vegetarian <clears throat> diet is rich in phytochemicals and antioxidants. What are phytochemicals? Phyto means plant. We find phytochemicals, protective chemicals, that are found only in plant food. Tomatoes, for instance, are loaded with uh, abundant phytochemicals. Well, I'm sure glad about that because that's one of my favorite mm -hmm. foods. <laughs> Especially in the summer. <laughs> and soybeans, from uh, which we can make tofu or soy milk or um, soy, soy meat, is packed full of protected, protective phytochemicals in addition to being loaded with protein. Studies show that soybeans actually reduce breast cancer, colon cancer, rectal cancer, lung cancer, and stomach cancer. So Teeny, what are antioxidants? Yes, antioxidants are very important. In fact, antioxidants are chemicals that found in food that can actually prevent or even repair damage to the cells caused by substances called those free radicals. And the highest antioxidants that we have are found in berries. And I'm mm. so glad because they're found in strawberries, blackberries, blueberries, raspberries, all those berries. Mm. I make sure my husband gets those every single day. And a plant-based diet also can help with these antioxidants to lower the risk of heart disease. In fact, it can even reverse, studies show that it can even reverse heart disease today. Let me share it with you. A report titled, Plant-Based Diet Reverses Heart Disease from the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. And they said this, a new research report confirms that heart disease can be dramatically improved, in fact, even reversed by a plant-based diet. So we have many, many different advantages, including reducing the risk of cancer. In fact, the World Health Organization's International Agency on Cancer reported this, Consuming processed meats such as bacon, ham, sausages, and lunch meats is carcinogenic, causing cancer to humans, and red meat intake is likely carcinogenic to humans as well. Mm -hmm. And so we want to keep you from these diseases. And even Harvard University Medical School is putting out the best diet, and that is vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and healthy protein. And you know, there's always studies going on in nutrition all the time, and recently my husband gave me this book, this last Christmas, called The Future of Nutrition. And it's by Dr. Campbell, who wrote this China study, and he points out that scientific evidence is that a whole food, plant-based diet is the very best for us. In fact, he has a theory called the constitutional theory that says the most convincing evidence of cancer's association with lifestyle 
and environment was illustrated by the effects of migration on cancer risk. And the most common hypothesis was that excessive nutrition, and that was particularly with meat and other high protein animal products, was responsible for cancer. So these are things that we can do to keep us from these dreaded diseases. In fact, as early as 1902, health educator Ellen White said, cancers, tumors, and pulmonary diseases are largely caused by cancer. So we don't want you to get these diseases. And that's why we're promoting what science is promoting on a plant-based diet. But Nancy, there are some other advantages to a plant-based diet. Tell us about another one. One of the big advantages, well, among many others, of course, in a plant-based <clears throat> diet is that it contains alkaline-forming foods. The right kind of food is primarily alkaline forming. In fact, the best diet should consist of at least 75% of alkaline forming foods. Here we see an example. What are of some that. alkaline forming foods? Well, fruits and vegetables, lentils, and we had lentils today. Seeds and some nuts are all alkaline-forming foods. The typical Western diet is acidic-forming. Acidic-forming foods include meat, fish, poultry, eggs, processed foods, desserts, and fast foods. Now, that's not including healthy desserts, though. If we have some good fruit for dessert or some good fruit balls, that's then right. Then <laughs> we can have some good healthy desserts. Many health pro problems today are associated with our body being too acidic. In fact, let's look at this normal cell on the left side. And let's look at the cell on the right side. The high acidic forming foods produce free radicals. And this is what we see in this right cell. The cell damaged uh, is, is damaged by the free radicals in our diet. So these free radicals set the stage for cancer, heart disease, other diseases, and premature aging. But let's look at something else, Nancy, that is so, an, so much of an advantage mm -hmm. with plant-based foods. It has no cholesterol. Plant-based foods have no cholesterol. Mm -hmm. But animal foods are high in cholesterol. And for good nutrition, we need to reduce that cholesterol intake. Even eggs are one of the yolk of the egg is one of the highest sources of cholesterol known to man, and in fact, the Heart Association says if you do use the yolk of the egg, don't use more than two or three even in cooking every week. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Neil Nedley, he's a medical doctor and he does a lot of scientific studies as well. He put out a book called Proof Positive, page 29, and he says this, a high intake of cholesterol which is present in meat, eggs, and dairy products, has also been linked to an increased incidence of cancer in several studies. And so we know that a high-fat diet, high-cholesterol diet, contributes to both cancer and heart disease. And look at some of the new studies. In an article titled Animal Protein Linked to Death by Thomas Campbell, who was the son of Thomas Campbell, who wrote the China study, says this. This is fascinating, my friends. Those that consumed the most animal protein compared to, pla pro to plant protein had a higher risk of death, not just the disease, but death, particularly cardiovascular disease. But look at those that consume the most plant protein. They were found to have 33% reduced risk of death and 40% reduced risk of cardiovascular death and 28% reduced risk of cancer death. And so 
in this study of the constitutional theory, Dr. Campbell says, in our experimental animal research, we found that increasing the carcin carcinogen dose caused a linear increase in the formation of mutations, but they expected that, but that those mutations only developed into cancer when they were promoted by eating animal protein. So there are so many things, my friends, that we can do to reduce, reduce these killer diseases. So let's look at all the advantages of a total vegetarian diet. It lowers blood cholesterol, lowers high blood pressure, lowers risk of certain cancers, lowers the risk of osteoporosis, improves diabetes, enhances vigor and endurance, and if you want to live longer, then you can do that on a plant-based diet. So Nancy, that's at least a few things on principle number one, but what's principle number two? Principle number two is eat at the right times. But what are the right times, Teeny? We need to establish regular eating times. Eating whether you eat two or three meals daily, we need to do those at regular times and eat nothing in between. They've done some longevity studies recently and one of the factors is no eating between meals. This allows the adequate time between meals to give your body the opportunity to properly digest the food from the previous meal. Uh, scientific breakthrough, breakthroughs prove this when it comes to nutrition, that timing is very important. When you eat, when you eat is as essential as what you eat for the maintaining an ideal weight, preventing some diseases, and living an energetic, longer, happier life. And you know, this is something that I don't think many of us uh, knew years ago, that, that it is so important to have regularity, not only in sleeping, but in our eating. They are doing some new studies, and I'm sure if you have been interested in health, this has come out just uh, in the not too distant past, but uh, there are new guidelines for setting our food clock. And it's a new way of eating. And this uh, is from National Geographic and Dr. Michael Rosen. Eat in chorus with your circadian rhythm. This biology is determined by the light. Your body wants to eat when the sun shines and fast when the sun sets. So, what does that mean? <laughs> that means that breakfast is the most important meal mm -hmm. of the day. That's what it means, my mm -hmm. friends. Mm -hmm. That's right. Because when you wake up in the morning, it's time to break the fast of not eating preferably at least since 12 hours before. So your body is needing that, those nutrients. It's needing to eat. Morning, uh, your breakfast should actually be uh, your largest meal. Dinner in the middle of the day should be very substantial, and supper in your evening meal should be the lightest meal of the day because you don't want to have a full stomach when you go to sleep at night because it interferes with the quality of sleep. So we say eat breakfast like a king, lunch like a pauper or dinner, and supper like a pauper. Luigi Fontana, a physician and co-director of the Longevity Research Program at Washington University in St. Louis, has told us, has found out from his research that fasting for as little as 16 hours could improve some health measures and counteract disease processes. Eating in a six hour window and fasting for eight hours may help you live longer. Abstaining from food for 16 to 18 hours a day could be key to treating a variety of health conditions.
So what that basically means is mm -hmm. try to eat your lighter meal in the evening mm -hmm. and your big meal at breakfast. And so I'll tell you, you need to jumpstart your day with breakfast, a good breakfast. I want to make sure I feed my husband a good breakfast every single day because that's the most important meal of the day. So what does a good breakfast contain? Lots of fruits, lots of grains, nuts, and seeds because they're high in fiber. And we can even add some beans to our breakfast because it gives us not only, pro not only fiber, but also protein. They're high in fiber, protein, and nutritious, delicious, and even satisfying. So for good nutrition, eat foods that are high in fiber. And guess what? The good foods are all high in fiber because all your fruits has an abundance of fiber. So what should our breakfast look like, my friends? Well, let's say that they should be well planned. In fact, I like to plan even the day before. And I set the table even the night before because I want to be ready for that good breakfast. It should be nutritious, so it should have some good fruit and some grains and even some nuts and seeds because do you know, men, you can reduce your, your heart disease by 50% if you eat some nuts in the morning, just a handful of nuts five times a day, five times a week. And then... Uh, you have it simple and easy, attractive, full of variety at regular times, as Nancy mentioned, and then lots of color. Color spells nutrition. So, Nancy, how are we going to do this? Is it possible to plan a good, nutritious meal on a plant-based diet? It is, Teeny. It's very possible. And you see this beautiful plate here. It has all of the nutrients you need. But Tini, do you have any ideas you could share with these folks if they want to try planning a, a plant-based meal? Well, I know I have written a cookbook, and in that cookbook we have loads of recipes and lots of plant-based uh, foods for breakfast and for dinner and for a light supper. You see, plant-based vegetarians have plenty of healthy mm -hmm. breakfast choices and other choices. In fact, let's give them a few of these choices, Nancy. What about having some applesauce on toast with some protein of peanut butter? Have oh, you ever done that? Oh, yeah, it's <laughs> wonderful. Take whole grain bread, put it in the toaster, get some natural peanut butter, spread it on the toast. To make the applesauce extra special, heat it up, put that on the peanut butter toast, and add some fresh fruit and nuts on top, and it is fabulous. And this is a one-dish meal. You have your protein with your nuts and your mm -hmm. peanut butter. You have your fruits, so you have your antioxidants and all your vitamins mm -hmm. and minerals. And you have your grains with your bread. You can have just this, and it's mm -hmm. wonderful. And then we can also give them some pancakes. Mm. How about some whole wheat banana pancakes? They are 100% whole grain and delicious. And you're mm -hmm. getting some fruit in there as well. And maybe even some blueberry flaxseed pancakes. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if we can get some more protein with beans. Have you ever had beans for oh, breakfast? Oh, <laughs> yes. I grew up eating beans on bread. And to make these really special, get some fresh lemon and squeeze on top. It's, it's delicious. And we can even give them some French toast. Mm -hmm. We have this also. You see, we have so many mm -hmm. options, my friends. And we can put some of those antioxidant blueberries on the yeah. top. They are filled with antioxidants. But I wonder if we could even have some rice for breakfast, Nancy. Ooh, yes. Whole grain rice with fresh fruit mm. and sprinkle some nuts inside. It's delicious. And you have to try it, you know. Don't, don't be naysayers until you try it. <laughs> it's delicious. And what about Oh, tofu, tofu, scrambled tofu with onions and garlic and fresh peppers and, and uh, 
Potatoes, breakfast potatoes, it's a wonderful breakfast. And one of my favorite things to keep on hand at all times, my friends, is good granola. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'm kind of known for my granola because um, that's the cover of my book because I make granola and have it all the time. It's delicious, nutritious, and full of fiber. It's wonderful. But we can also have some cashew oat waffles. Mm -hmm. They are really, really tasty. These are all plant-based foods. You see, we're not saying you have to give up anything, just the bad things that are for you mm -hmm. and add the good things. Mm -hmm. And so what about dinner, though, Nancy? Do we have any plant-based foods for dinner? Oh, yes. Dinner should include, uh, well, here we have potatoes, you have string beans, uh, plant-based protein, and a fresh green salad, which uh, is really what we should have every day. Yes. Yeah. And what are these, Teeny? Well, these are my oat burgers in my book. They are just made, you see, because oats are a wonderful grain as well, and you get protein. Did you know there are 16 grams of protein in one cup of oats? So you're getting some protein, but you can make that into a nice burger sandwich. You can have some lettuce, some tomatoes, some onion, and you have a wonderful burger sandwich. So there are so many options. There are wheat germ patties. And what's the most important thing, though, that we should have every day, Nancy? A fresh salad. Fresh salad. Greens are so full of phytochemicals. We need to have some type of green, fresh green Can vegetable every day. Can we bury that? Can we have some? Oh, yes. What about some spinach? Spinach is great. And you know, in the winter time, if you're a tomato lover, you, you're not too happy with the tomatoes in the winter, try putting fruit. Mandarin oranges, um, strawberries, pear, grapefruit, pear and grapefruit, and purple onion with poppy seed dressing. There are an infinite way, number of ways. So many mm -hmm. different things that you can do to make your salads interesting, mm -hmm. and they are nutritious, mm -hmm. and we need them. And then we have millet patties mm -hmm. and quinoa patties. And what about even having some healthy pasta and vegetarian mm, meatballs? With some garlic bread. Yeah. Sounds good. <laughs> yes, you see, my friends, we have so many options that we can do. But, but Teeny, yes. when Thanksgiving and Christmas come, and all of your kids come home, and all of our kids and grandkids come home, there are 18 of us. We call it chaotic bliss. <laughs> what do you do for those special occasions? Oh, for the holidays, there are so many things that you can do for your dinner. You can have those mashed potatoes still. You can have your vegetarian roast. You can have your butternut squash. You can have your mm. salads, all these things. But you can have a healthy plant-based cashew holiday roast. But you know what we love to do is make a chicken salad. Now, this chicken sal this chicken without any bones and feathers, is made from garbanzo beans. Garbanzo beans, all plant-based. And you can even make it into a sandwich. And at the holiday times, Nancy, I will even cut some oatmeal bread and some whole grain bread into bells. Just make, mm -hmm. take those cookie cutters and make mm -hmm. them into bells and have a delicious sandwich made mm. out of garbanzo beans. It's so wonderful. And you know what else? We could even make a wonderful, kind of a nice wedding cake potato salad. <laughs> it looks delicious. And it's so there's so many things we can do for the yeah. holidays. Yeah. But what but, about? But what do we do for dessert options, especially for those who have 28 sweet teeth in their mouths? <laughs> well, let's make some strawberry homemade oh. strawberry ice cream. And Ooh. I have tasted this. This is fabulous. Well, is and fabulous. we can make some other ice cream just mm -hmm. out of frozen bananas and mm -hmm. frozen strawberries. Mm -hmm. That's all this is. Just mm -hmm. frozen bananas, frozen strawberries with some nuts on top. We put it through the champion juicer. Mm. And what about some pies, Nancy? Are there some pies oh, that we can have? Carrot pie. I don't know if you've had carrot pie or butternut squash pie or pumpkin. It's like pumpkin pie. Yeah. It's fabulous. You can make pecan pie, apple pie, 
the yes. all-American pie. And then our grandchildren love the dried fruit balls. Oh, yes, we do too. In fact, mm -hmm. there are wonderful mm -hmm. holiday food made out of dried fruit balls. Yeah. And then we can make some date bars. Mm -hmm. But what about a birthday party? Are we going to have any desserts? Sure, you can have carob cake or isn't that beautiful? Or you can have, uh, it looks like a German chocolate cake. You can have strawberry shortcake or fresh fruit. Yes, yep. fresh fruit is always good. So Nancy, here we have it. God's healthy eating plan. Eat the right kind of foods and you're gonna live longer. Eat at the right times, you're gonna live longer. Mm -hmm. Eat the right amount and you're going to live longer. But Nancy, there's one last principle. What is that? We need to eat the right amount of food. If you are gaining weight, you are either eating too much or not exercising enough. If you are losing weight and you're at an ideal weight, you need to eat a little more because it's better to stay at an ideal weight and not get too thin because when you get sick, you don't have any reserve. But Teeny, <laughs> do you have a prescription for the people this evening? I do. Here's our natural prescription for tonight. Eat every day a wide variety of fruits, nuts, grains, and vegetables. And you know what? You will be healthier, you will be happier, and you will live longer. So may God bless you as you choose, choose God's, God's way, way. Because it's God's way, way is, is the always the, the best, best way. way. <laughs> yes. God bless you. Thank you, ladies. Are you feeling energetic? Are you, you know, when you make changes in your life, you can't make those changes all at once. And so as a result of that, what we encourage people to do is start moving more toward a diet that is whole food diet. And you don't go home and throw out all the bad things because then you'll go looking for them the next day. But you begin step by step trying to have a better lifestyle. Remember, if you're here Friday night, we're going to give you a book called Living Long and Beautiful Life. It is the only night we're going to give it out. It summarizes by major health providers throughout the world these great health principles that we've been talking about every single night. It's yours free. We want to give it to you as a gift. Each evening, Charles Hagebrooks has come lifted our spirits, encouraged our hearts, and given us music for the ages. Charles, thanks so much again for singing. Thank you, Lisa. In my dark, Jesus found me touched my eyes and made me see broke sin's chain that long had bound me gave me life and liberty the glorious love of Christ my Lord divine and that made him stoop to save a soul like mine through all my days and then in the heaven above my song will sign us never I will worship him forever and praise him for his glorious love oh what amazing truth to ponder he whom the angels host attend Lord of heavens, God's Son, what wonder That he became the sinner's friend The glorious love of Christ my Lord divine 
that made him stoop to save a soul like mine. Through all my days and been in the heaven above, my song will silence never. I will worship him forever and praise him for his glorious love. In my darkness, Jesus found me, touched my eyes and made me see. Broke sin's chain that long had bound me, and it gave me life and liberty. Oh, glorious love of Christ, my Lord divine, that made him stoop to save a soul like mine. Through all my days and then in heaven above, my song will silence never. I will worship him forever and praise him for his glorious love. I will worship him forever and praise him for his glorious love and praise him for his glorious love I'll praise him for his glorious I'll praise him for his glorious love. Can you say amen? amen? That's what we're here tonight to do. Thank you. The two of you, beautiful musicians, both of them. You know, I feel healthier having just listened to Teeny and Nancy, don't you? In fact, you know, choices of what you eat what you watch, what you do, how you live, are critical to the end product. So I hope that you'll take a good note of the health lectures that have been given, and I know that you'll be healthier for it. We don't earn our way to heaven by being a vegetarian, but when you live healthfully, your mind will be clearer and you can make decisions, especially about subjects like what we're going to talk about tonight. Personally, I've been a vegetarian all my life. Grew up in a vegetarian home. We have a vegetarian home. It's a blessing. But it helps us to live more accurately and healthfully in God's perspective so that we can make wise spiritual choices because the mind is part of the body. And if the mind is weak because the body is weak, you won't be able to fully understand the beautiful subject of tonight. So before we begin, I'm going to pray again because we need a clear mind. Now, Lord, we just come to you for a moment. This is an important subject tonight, one which could be a little confusing for some, but it's all there in your word. And so, Lord, help us to make wise decisions and follow you and help our bodies to be clean and pure Help our minds to be the same, for the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for hearing us. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. 
Well, tonight's topic is Revelation's eternal sign in Earth's last conflict. You know, when it comes to the question of the origin of life, you have basically two positions. One is, there is a God. The other one is, there isn't a God. Either God has always existed and brought about the creation of the entire cosmos, not just this earth, but the entire universe, or all of it just came about by simple chance. And as we look around nature and, and we study the amazing uh, complexity of even the simplest forms of life, we realize that God has left his fingertips all throughout the universe, from the smallest living organism to the amazing far reaches of outer space. I have to tell you one of the things that confounds my mind personally is to think of limitless space. I can think about it for just about as long as I've just said that sentence. And then it boggles my mind. God is limitless. The universe is limitless. I, I, I can't grasp it. But that's our God. A God that gives us evidence that he is the creator. A God that shaped the world. A God that fashioned this globe. Now, the book of Revelation describes a vision in which John was brought to the very throne of the all-powerful creator God. Here in this vision, in Revelation chapter 4, we find a clarion call, a bold call, for men and women living in Earth's last hour to return to the worship of the creator God turning people back to the true worship of God. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1. Come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. So in this prophetic vision, John travels to the throne room of the universe. I mean, amazing. It's just fantastic. If you want to read another account, you can read one in Revelation uh, in Revelation 4, the, the whole chapter, you can read one in uh, Isaiah 6. Absolutely incredible, the throne room of God. And then he hears these sounds of praise. And Revelation 4 is magnificent in helping us understand, really, true worship. You are worthy, O Lord, verse 11, to receive glory and honor and power for, and here's the reason, you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. So all of heaven sings this magnificent song to the creator. Now some scientists may not know how life arose or how the universe got here. But all of heaven knows because all the angels sing, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power because you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. So they weren't just created, but they exist. Our very breath and life this evening in the Warren Performing Arts Center is because God has given you that life. He nurtures it and he continues that life. We did not evolve out of some cosmic accident, but we were created by a loving, caring God created in his image. Now, before you existed, even in the womb of your mother, you existed in the mind of God. Uh, 
that, that's, that's a profound thought. God fashioned you. God shaped you. God created you. The book of Revelation calls humanity back to worshiping the Creator. Now, there's an answer to the question of human origins. It's found in the book of Revelation. It's part of his end time message for all people. Revelation calls us to, and here it is, in Revelation 14, magnificent chapter, verse 7, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. In an age of evolution and the preponderance of many individuals believing in evolution, God sends a message to the entire human race calling us to worship the Creator, not our own figment of imagination as to how we got here. No, this is a message for all of us. All of us here in this beautiful auditorium in the Performing Arts Center, and those of you watching worldwide through live streaming. It's not a message for just one religious group, or perhaps one other. It's, it's not a message for a denomination, just one or another. It's God's final call to his people to worship the Creator. Well, how do we worship the Creator of heaven and earth? And how does he remind us of this creative power? At creation, did he leave us a symbol, a reminder of what this special creative authority sign was? Revelation is the book of endings, all right? It's the last book in the New Testament and in the Bible itself. We can only understand the book of the endings if we understand the book of the beginnings. We'll only understand the significance of the monumental issue in today's world if we understand the events at creation. So Revelation's final call to the entire human race to worship this creator God, our creator God, has its origin in Genesis, the first book of the Bible, the book of beginnings. This theme of true worship, remembering the creator, is a common thread throughout the entire scripture. It's one of the most important themes of the Bible. The heart of Revelation's final crisis, and this is so important, the heart of Revelation's final crisis is over true or false worship. Worshiping the Creator is at the center of it all. So let's now return to our origin so we can understand our destiny. The amazingly intricate world as we know it today was created in six literal days. That's what I believe, and that's what scripture teaches. Our creator spoke, just said it, and the earth came into existence. He dazzled it with light, and enveloped it with the atmosphere. He brightened it with babbling brooks and flowing rivers and colored it with beautiful flowers and plants. He enlivened it in a, in a variety of, of beautiful ways. Can you imagine the ingenuity and creativity of God, all the variety in the world? He spoke and it was done. Day by day, looking upon his handwork, that's over the six days now, he keeps saying, it is good. Now he wasn't really complimenting himself, he was just enjoying what his creative power had done. And then came the crowning act of creation, turning to the Father, 
the Creator said, Genesis chapter 1 and verses 26 and 27, let us, now that's a beautiful word right in there, that, that pronoun, let us, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, let us make man in our image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. You see, human beings, man could receive no greater honor. God could have shown no greater love. The human race is God's masterpiece of creation, the object of his absolute supreme love. After the creation of Adam and Eve on the sixth day, the Bible says in chapter 2, verse 1, thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. Just six days of work. And creation was done. Such a short time. But not for God. The account of creation is not over, though, on the sixth day. The second and third verses of chapter 2 indicate the following. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Now, you might ask the question, God rested? I mean, was he tired? All he did was speak. And it happened, although with human beings he formed us out of the dust of the earth. That took a little effort, but that's not something to necessarily get tired about. It really was because he was pleased with his accomplishments over the earth's first six days. Then God did something especially significant. Let's look at this now in a very careful way. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Now the seventh day Sabbath given at creation, was to be God's perpetual reminder of our roots, our origin. Now let's look at three specific things about the seventh day. Remarkable things, things that will shine out to us as we look at them. First of all, God blessed it. The Bible says God blessed the seventh day. He made the seventh day as an endless fountain of spiritual refreshing for his people for all time to come. Secondly, God sanctified it. That means he set it apart. When you sanctify something, when you, when you place it in a unique relationship, you set it apart as a holy day a special time every seven days to continually remind you of your beginnings, your origin, where you came from, your roots, why you're here. And then thirdly, it says God rested on it. The Bible does not say that God blessed the first day or the third day or the fifth day or any other day except the seventh day. Now, that doesn't mean he doesn't like those other days. He made those other days. He used those other days. But he did something unique, something set apart on the seventh day. Now, whatever God blesses, according to 1 Chronicles chapter 17, verse 27, he blesses forever. So to bless, and this is important, to bless is to infuse something with God's very presence because 
it becomes holy because he is holy. God blessed the seventh day by making it an eternal sign of his powerful creation and his infinite love. He rested on the seventh day, not because he was tired, but because he knew you and I would be tired. God sanctified the seventh day. He set it apart for holy, unique adoration of him. Now the word sanctified, and, and this is going to be an interesting uh, illustration. I really love this illustration. It's just so right to the point. The word sanctified is the word that's used by God for the marriage ceremony. And what a privilege it is to have a precious uh, husband or wife, a spouse. My, my wonderful wife, Nancy, I'm not going to embarrass her too much, but she's precious. And this is, the Lord has, has set us apart as a couple, just as those of you who are married know. So this marriage ceremony is when one woman is set apart or sanctified for one man. That's the Bible, the Bible understanding. Now, here's this illustration, and I like it. Let's suppose a man gets married, and the woman he marries has, get this, six sisters. After the ceremony, the man is waiting in the car to head out on the honeymoon. One of the sisters of the one that he married slips in beside him in the car and tells him, now this is one of the sisters, she says, let's go. And he looks at her in absolute amazement and semi-horror, and he says, I didn't marry you, I married your sister. And her reply is, well, what difference does it make? I'm, I'm one in seven. Does it make any difference? It certainly makes a difference to the two who got married. There was one who was sanctified or set apart for him, and it wasn't that sister. All women are not the same. And I mean, we can say the same thing about men. And all days are not the same. Now the Sabbath was created, and this is important, 2,300 years before the existence of the Jewish race. Keep that in your mind. It was given to our first parents, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden. The Sabbath was set aside at creation as an eternal symbol of God's creative power for his people in all ages. When Adam and Eve left the garden, the Sabbath remained as a reminder of God's eternal love. Exodus 16. We read the remarkable story of the falling of manna. Manna is that substance which God produced, fell from heaven every day, and it was to sustain the children of Israel in the wilderness. Where, the, where Mount Sinai is and the whole Sinai Peninsula, I've been there, I grew up in Egypt and Cairo myself, love Egypt and I love the Middle East, and it's very barren in the Sinai Desert. So God used this to provide food which they collected. In fact, the meaning of the word manna is, what is it? Well, let's go on to see what the Lord said in Exodus 16, 26. Six days you shall gather it, that's the manna, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, there will be none. So God worked a miracle for Israel. He met their needs with this special manna that would fall from heaven. They would collect it every day. They would use it. They would cook it. They would uh, bake it, whatever it was. And it fell every day except Sabbath. 
if the Israelites gathered more than they could eat, the leftover portion would spoil. When some Israelites went out to gather manna on the Sabbath day, God said, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? Well, on Mount Sinai, God wrote with his own finger on tables of stone the Sabbath commandment. He didn't write these commandments in the sand to be just washed away. He didn't write them on parchment to be consumed in some fire. God did not write the Sabbath command on a little piece of paper hidden in a corner. God wrote it on tables of stone. He wrote the law to endure forever. God didn't even entrust Moses to write it. Moses wrote the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, but God wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger. Now let me ask you something. If the Bible, if in the Bible, there's only one set of laws written with God's own finger, if God wrote them on tables of stone, can we turn our backs on the eternal law of God written with his own finger? Well, the Bible says this, and this is the fourth commandment uh, in Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. Let's read it. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, we can keep holy only what God makes holy. All right? Human beings can't make things holy. God made the Sabbath day holy, and he blessed it at creation. He sanctified it. And so then he began that commandment with one word. What did it say? Remember. Why did God say to remember? Because he knew we would forget. In fact, it's the only commandment that says, remember, starting out, remember. He knew in an age of evolution, men and women would forget the Sabbath and their origins. So God said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. God is calling us back to an eternal sign of creation. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. Now, notice he doesn't say a seventh day is the Sabbath. He says the seventh day is the Sabbath. And just as the day before your birthday and the day after your birthday, do not commemorate the day you were born. The Sabbath is very specific. The first day, the third day, the fifth day, doesn't matter. They, they, they don't commemorate the birth of the earth by the Creator God. That's why we are to worship on the seventh day. Exodus 20, verse 11. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that in them is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it, or blessed it, or made it apart, separated from the others. So the Ten Commandment law quotes Genesis and leads us back to when God created the earth. The Sabbath was never exclusively a day of worship or institution for the Jewish people. It was given for all humanity. You see, the Jewish nation was to be God's special emissaries and missionaries at the crossroads of the world, and they were to share this message with everyone. Just as the commandment says, thou shalt not kill, is not only for the Jews. Just as the commandment, 
thou shalt not worship any graven image is not only for the Jews. The Sabbath is not exclusively a Jewish Sabbath. It was given to our first parents long before the existence of the Jewish nation. It is for all New Testament and Old Testament believers, everyone combined. The Bible says the Sabbath was made for man, humanity everywhere. Isaiah 56, verses 6 and 7. Everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath, I will bring to my holy mountain. Well, let's ask the question, what's God's holy mountain? What is that? It is the new Jerusalem, heaven. He says, everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath, I will bring to my holy mountain and make them, a joyful, make them joyful in my, my house of prayer. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. He says, all nations are one day going to worship around my throne in the New Jerusalem every Sabbath. Throughout the Old Testament, the Sabbath was God's everlasting sign for all his people. Ezekiel 20 and verse 12. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. So the Sabbath is not only a sign that God created us, it's a sign that he can recreate in our hearts something new. When I come to worship him on the Sabbath day, I say, God, you are the all-powerful creator. You can recreate something new in my heart. God gave the Sabbath to Adam and Eve at creation. He gave the Sabbath to Moses in the Ten Commandment Law. He gave the Sabbath as a sign all through the Old Testament of his power to recreate hearts. He gave the Sabbath as a sign of his love to us and a symbol of his, his divine authority and his creative authority. But somebody might say, oh, come on, Pastor. What about the New Testament? <clears throat> what about Jesus Christ? Did Jesus come to do away with the Sabbath? Didn't he do that? I mean, did the disciples change the Sabbath? Did they worship on another day? Well, let's look at the New Testament. What did Jesus teach about the Bible Sabbath? Here's a marvelous text in Luke chapter 4 and verse 16. So he came to Nazareth, that's where he grew up, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, his habit, his intention, his activity, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. So Jesus worshipped every Sabbath when he walked this earth. It was the Sabbath that he had created in the beginning. If Jesus wanted to leave another sign for us, another symbol of worship, wouldn't you expect him to leave us a positive example in his own life? You see, isn't it true that a, a person's will and testament is sealed by their death? You can't change a person's will after they die. And Christ's will and testament was sealed at his death. But the legacy of his life was, and we look at this again, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Indeed, Christ kept the Bible Sabbath. He himself said, Mark chapter 2, verse 27, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Now he doesn't say the Sabbath was made for 
only Jewish people. It's for Jewish people, yes, it's for everyone. The Sabbath was made for man. It was made for all humanity. The Sabbath was made for the Jews and Gentiles alike as a sign of God's creation and his ultimate authority. It's a sign that we worship him exclusively. It's a sign that we worship him supremely with all of our hearts. We were not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made as God's gift to us. Adam and Eve were made first. The Sabbath is God's gift to the human race. And Adam and Eve enjoyed that first Sabbath. Every Sabbath, we flee from the stresses of life to his palace in time. The tensions of life seem to evaporate because we don't work on the seventh day. The Sabbath is an eternal sign that he created us. We are to remember where we came from. Even in death, Jesus Christ kept the Sabbath. Jesus' closest followers rested according to the commandment. They wouldn't even embalm his body on the Sabbath day. Jesus rested on the Sabbath before he was resurrected on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. Jesus kept the Sabbath in life. He kept the Sabbath in death. Jesus said, John 14, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. As we've already learned, love leads us to obedience. Love leads us to keep his precious commandments. Jesus told his disciples that even after his death, even after the crucifixion, even after the resurrection, they would be keeping the Sabbath. One day Jesus gathered his disciples together and he discussed the coming destruction of Jerusalem in that mighty chapter 24 of Matthew. And in verse 20 it says, and pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. Now, what sense would it have made for Jesus to say to his disciples, pray that your flight or your escape, your running away, would not be on the Sabbath if they weren't going to be keeping the Sabbath. It wouldn't have made any sense at all. Why did he say that? If they were all worshiping on the Sabbath together in one place and the Roman armies attacked the city, what would have happened? Well, the Roman armies would have destroyed them. Jerusalem was destroyed in A.D. 70 a terrible tragedy that took place. You can read about it and the events leading up to it. This was years after Jesus had already ascended to heaven. Now, some people might say, okay, Pastor, you, you know, you're, you're trying to make some logical sense out of all this. I understand that, but hasn't time been lost over the centuries? How can you know which day really is the seventh day Sabbath today? Well, there are at least three ways that we can know. First of all, you can know it from the Bible. That's what we've been doing so far. Secondly, you can know it from language. Thirdly, you can know it from astronomy. Now, you'll recall that the Sabbath was stated at creation, and it was restated in the Ten Commandments given to Moses. Now, it's clear that there was no time lost between Adam and Moses. Why? Well, Adam kept the seventh-day Sabbath, and so did Moses. So all through the Old Testament, from Moses then, and certainly <laughs> if people had not been keeping the right Sabbath when God gave the Ten Commandments written with his own finger, he would have corrected them. So you know that has to be accurate. Now, from Moses to Jesus, God's people kept the Sabbath, and the Jewish people are very meticulous about these records. 
So there was no time lost then. The crucifixion story clearly reveals that the weekly cycle as we know it was not changed from Jesus' time until today. Now, let's look at the sequence of days from the Bible. We begin with the day Jesus died. The Bible describes it this way, Luke 23, and beginning with verse 54. That day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew near. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Now let's ask this question. Were the closest followers of Jesus keeping the Sabbath after he died? What does it say? Yes. They rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. They did not believe that his death changed the commandment in any way. Now here we have three days listed in succession. The day of Christ's death, which was called preparation, that's Friday, the preparation day for the Sabbath. And then the Sabbath, according to the commandment, the seventh day. Then the Bible says, now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them, and what did they do? They came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. So let's look at the order of those events. It's, it's really quite clear. You have three days. The preparation day, the day Christ died. And what day was that? Friday, preparation day. The next day, the Sabbath, the day he rested according to the commandment. And what day was that? Many people call it Saturday, the Sabbath day. And the next day, the first day of the week, when the women anointed his body. And what day was Jesus resurrected? First day, Sunday the first day of the week. The identity of the Sabbath is very clear from the sequence. Sabbath is the seventh day of the weekly cycle or the day many people call Saturday. Many Christians have said, but we worship on Sunday in honor of the resurrection. I want to tell you Christ has given us a symbol of the resurrection. How do we celebrate the resurrection? Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ, Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. So just as Jesus died, was buried, and was resurrected, we do that by being baptized, by immersion. We come up from the symbolic watery grave, to live the new life. Baptism in, is the New Testament symbol of the resurrection. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day. You honor him as creator by keeping the Bible Sabbath. Now, this is very interesting. I'm sure many of you know different languages. In over 140 languages of the world, the word for the seventh day of the week is Sabbath. In Spanish, it's sabado, okay? Feliz sabado, happy Sabbath. In Russian, Ukrainian, Bulgarian, it's sabota. In Arabic, it's asabit. 
In all the cultures of the world, there is no question about this. When you look at languages, it's very plain. The word for the day in English we call Saturday is Sabbath. Now, according to such trustworthy sources, as the Royal Greenwich Observatory in Greenwich, England, and the United States Naval Observatory, the weekly cycle has never changed. Jesus kept the Sabbath. Peter, James, John, Paul, other disciples, they kept the Sabbath. Acts 17, verses 1 and 2. They came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures. So Paul preached about Christ. It was the Sabbath. The interesting thing is that some of the Gentiles were there. So, Acts 13, 42 says, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. So here's Paul with the Gentiles, all right? These people aren't Jews. He's teaching them about Jesus. And the Bible says in Acts 13, verse 44, on the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. Can you imagine a whole city coming together to praise and worship God? Praise be to God in heaven. I wish that the entire city of Indianapolis would be doing that. That every city around this country and throughout the world, if they did, there would be far less violence, far less tension, far less anger between people because God's presence would be with his people. You see, the Sabbath represents the harmony of the human race. In Christ, we are one humanity. And on Sabbath, we celebrate our oneness. When we come to worship him on Sabbath, he bonds us together as one common humanity. No more language barriers, racial barriers, economic barriers, social barriers. We are one in Jesus Christ. The disciples kept the Sabbath. Acts 16, verse 13. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. You see, in this city, there was no Sabbath-keeping church. So the Apostle Paul met with a group of believers by a quiet river to worship on the Sabbath day. In these last days of Earth's history, and I have to tell you, I believe with all my heart, we are nearing the coming of Jesus Christ. In these last days, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ that is being given to the world. Revelation calls us back to the true worship of God. But somebody says, well, <clears throat> I thought Christians now were to keep the Lord's day. Well, let's see what Revelation says. Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Uh, someone says, oh, I keep the Lord's day. Well, wait a minute. Does this particular text, Revelation 1.10, tell you which day the Lord's day is? You see, human beings may try to define the Lord's day, but Jesus knows better. Let's let Jesus defined the words of the Lord's day. Matthew 12, verse 8. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Mark 2, 28. Therefore the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Luke 6, 5. The Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. 
Why do you think the Bible includes the same thing three times? Because it's important. Repetition helps us remember. And if the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath, then the Sabbath must be the Lord's day. You see, the Sabbath of the Creator God in Genesis is the Lord's day of revelation. It's the same Creator in Revelation as he was in Genesis. Just as he declared to the first inhabitants of the earth, I blessed, sanctified, and rested on the Sabbath. He calls all humanity, all of us, whether we're in Indianapolis or wherever you are watching right now, calls all of us to worship him in these end times, he does not change. Here are the last people on the earth. Revelation 14, 12. We quoted this text, I believe it was last night. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. These are the last day people, the remnant, those who are at the end of time, who are turning themselves through the power of God back to God. They are people who keep the commandments of God, all the commandments, and the faith of Jesus. So now the Sabbath, given at creation, given at Sinai, kept by his people, kept by Jesus, honored by the disciples, sign of God's power, kept on the new earth. Isaiah 66, verses 22 and 23 say, For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. So they'll come from the north, from the south, from the east, from the west. They'll come from China, from Russia, from Africa, from the Americas, from Europe, from around the world, they will come. And together, as one common humanity, together as brothers and sisters, as one family in Jesus Christ, we will come to give him praise, honor, and glory. Together, will come to praise the Christ who created the heavens and the earth. We'll come together with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We'll come together to praise Christ who died for us. Maybe you're thinking right now, you know, this is something new to me. I, I haven't really considered this before, but I know each of you has only one desire and that is to follow Jesus and do his will. You see, even if it's of a different persuasion of popular opinion, even if it's different from conventional religion and its teachings, you want one thing only, and that is Bible truth. Your heart wants only one thing, Jesus, him crucified and risen again and coming soon. Charles, God leads. He brings us to the foot of the cross. Charles, come and sing to us that marvelous, wonderful song that will help us to understand that God leads his children 
in the right direction. Tonight, as you listen to this powerful message, how many of you would like to say, Lord, teach me. No matter what others may teach, teach me to follow you. I want to worship you as creator and Lord. And every week, I want to find that Sabbath rest. For me, the most important thing is to follow Jesus. As you listen to the song about Jesus leading us, may it help you to make the right decision, a decision of eternal consequences. Charles. In shady green pasture, so rich, so bright, God leaves his dear children along where the cool waters flow, bathe the the weary one's feet, God leads his dear children along. Summer through the waters, some through the flood. Some through the fire, but all through his blood. Some through a great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night season. And all the day long Summer times on the mount Where the sun shines so bright God leads his dear children along sometimes in the valley in the darkest of night God leads his dear children along some through the some through the flood Some through the fire But all through his blood Some through great sorrow but God gives you a song in the night season.
in your night season. God leads his dear children along. Thank you. God leads his dear children along. He will lead you, and he will always lead you to full Bible truth. How many of you tonight, <clears throat> even if this, <clears throat> excuse me, even if this may be a little new to you, you haven't thought about it enough, you haven't studied God's word, and I urge you to do it, but how many of you tonight would just like to signify to the Lord, Lord, I want you to lead me in full Bible truth. Could I see your hands tonight? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come to you recognizing that you have given us such amazing truth as to where we have come from. You created us. And you created a day in which we were to remember that you created us, to honor you because it was sanctified, set apart, holy, the seventh day Sabbath. Now, Lord, for some, it may be a new thought, a new understanding. Lead them along the pathway to full Bible truth and help them to understand fully what your holy word has said. Lord, we don't keep the Sabbath in order to gain extra points in heaven. We keep the Sabbath because you asked us to do that and we love you. And we love to do what you say. So now, Lord, bless each one as they go home. Keep them safe and help them to ponder the things that they have heard tonight to fully understand that you love them with an everlasting love. And by remembering you on the seventh day Sabbath, you are saying, God, you have done everything for me. You have not only created me, but you can recreate in my own heart a new life and a new love for you. Bless each one and bring us back together on Friday evening as we focus upon your word in revelation of hope. Thank you for hearing us, and thank you for being our creator and for creating Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then blessing and sanctifying the seventh-day Sabbath. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Evening, new meetings, new messages from the book of Revelation. We're coming to the glorious climax. We've been through five meetings. We have four more to go, Friday night, two on Saturday morning, and one on Saturday night, right here. Friday night, we're going to be talking about God's people for today. How can you identify them with all the varying Christian denominations? You won't want to miss Friday night. Remember as well, when you are here Friday night, we're going to give you the book uh, of health meetings, Living Long and a Beautiful Life. We want you to live longer and healthier. We'll put that in your hand only on Friday night. In addition to that, we want you to look forward to Saturday morning. The, we're going to have a wonderful Bible baptism right here. We'll set up a beautiful baptismal pool where we can baptize by immersion. Many people are checking their cards. They're coming to us and saying, I've never made that full decision for Christ. I've never gone under the water. So we're going to have a beautiful baptismal service. You'll sense the moving, the power of God here Saturday morning. Some people were 
baptized or immersed once, but they've drifted away and they want to make a real new start, they too will be baptized. So if you're thinking about that, praying about it, certainly talk to us. We'll be happy to counsel with you about it and help you to plan for a beautiful experience with Jesus. Good night. God bless you. We'll see you on Friday night.